I have covered a few post games of Pokemon games here on the channel, and they have been some of my best performing videos. So first of all, thanks for checking them out and showing support. Secondly, we are back with another post game video today, as I'll be checking out all the things you can do after defeating the champion in Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. These Gen 1 remakes differ greatly from Pokemon Red and Blue when it comes to post-game content, as you don't just go running into a cave to catch a Pokemon with a big co- Anyways, I'll be using the same game file that I used in my Pokemon Ironmon challenge, so be sure to give that video a look once you're done here. For now though, it's time to actually play through the post-game of Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. As soon as I loaded up the game after becoming the champion, Professor Oak ran over to us and basically hinted to the fact that our adventure is still not over. Before diving into the post-game action though, I wanted to do some other things that I didn't do in my Ironmon challenge, including catching the legendary birds. However, because I randomized the game for that video, Zapdos was actually a Rhyhorn, and Articuno was a Persian. Nonetheless, I went ahead and caught them for the heck of it. Now in order to access the main areas in the post game, I had to complete the side quest on 1, 2, and 3 island first, which is accessible after defeating Blaine. If you don't know, this involves helping one of Bill's friends, Celio, by delivering a meteorite to a guy on 2 Island. Once that task is completed, the PC will be connected to the Hoenn and Orr region. I wanted to check out 1 Island first, so I headed south onto Treasure Beach, where different valuable items are hidden along the shore each day. I then headed north through Kindle Road, which featured the Ember Spa, where we received the HM for Rock Smash. This stretch of trainers led us to Mount Ember, where the third legendary bird, Moltres, was waiting for us. Or in my case, Whiskash was waiting for us. Two Island was relatively small, as we could only travel into the main town area. However, there were a few cool places to check out, like the market stall, which sells more items depending on how much progress you've made, the move tutor for Frenzy Plant, Blast Burn, and Hydro Cannon, the move maniac, and finally the joyful game corner. The owner of this place was actually the guy that we're supposed to give the meteorite to, but he's too busy freaking out about his missing daughter, Lostel. So, that only left a three island, which is where Lostel was located. Just outside of the dock was the Three Isle Path, which was just a small tunnel, but if you get the National Dex, it'll turn into a large tunnel, and the guy inside will give you a nugget. Upon reaching the mainland, we saw that the Kanto Rider Federation was taunting many of the citizens. After defeating multiple of the members in some battles, we moved on to the Bond Bridge, as well as the Berry Forest, where Lostel was too scared to move because of a wild Hypno. Silly Lostel, it was only an Electrike. Anyways, after rescuing her, we delivered the meteorite to her father, meaning Bill and Celio finished the PC maintenance, so it was finally time to get into the real post-game content. Well, sort of. In order to get the Rainbow Pass from Celio, we had to own the National Dex, so I went around Kanto and caught 60 Pokemon, allowing for Professor Oak to hand us the upgraded Pokedex. Back in the Pokemon Center slash laboratory on one island, Celio claimed that he needed a special gemstone for the networking system to support long distance trades. Luckily, the gemstone was right here on one island. We had to deal with some Team Rocket shenanigans first, but then we traversed through another section of Mount Ember, 
before reaching the last room, which was home to the ruby. Unfortunately, the ruby wasn't enough for Celio to get the network machine working. He told us that another gemstone was needed, and that it's located on one of the previously unaccessible Sevi Islands. However, with the new Rainbow Pass Celio gave to us, we sailed on over to Island Number 4. Right after we hopped off the boat, our rival was bragging about himself, like always, but I did receive this cool sticker for our trainer card from this random guy. The only other attraction on 4 Island was the Icefall Cave, where Lorelei was having a chat with a few members of Team Rocket. After knocking out their Pokemon in battle, they revealed one of their two passwords to the Rocket Warehouse on 5 Island. I skipped the 5th Island for now though, since the second password was actually told to us on 6 Island. This mostly water-filled area consisted of the Water Path, Green Path, Pattern Bush, and Outcast Island, which contained the pointless Altering Cave. On the south side of the island, though, was Ruin Valley, which spiraled inwards towards the Dotted Hole. By using Cut on the entrance, and dropping down a combination of different holes, we reached the second gemstone. However, before grabbing it, a scientist came out of nowhere and stole the sapphire from us. He said he was going to sell it to Team Rocket, but he also exposed the second Team Rocket password. With this new information, we barged into the warehouse on Five Island and retrieved the sapphire back from the corrupted scientist. Also, fun fact, it's theorized that a few of the grunts in this building end up becoming the admins in the Johto games, as they claim that they want to revive Team Rocket. Other than defeating the evil team once and for all, Five Island offered Memorial Pillar, where a guy was sadly paying respect to his dead Onyx, the Water Labyrinth, where we could have gotten a Togepi Egg if I had room in my party, and Resort Gorgeous, home to a lady named Selfie. However, she was wandering around the Lost Cave at the time, so after heading in there and defeating her in a battle, she took us back to her home, only to demand to see a new Pokemon every single day. In my opinion, it's not worth saving her. Last but not least was Seven Island, where the trainer tower loomed over, and this is basically Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green's Battle Tower. Besides that, there was the Sevolt Canyon, where we completed a puzzle in the Tenobi Key, allowing us to capture all the forms of unknown in the Tenobi Ruins just south of the canyon. Also, there was this guy who mentioned that Bruno trained with Brawly at one point in time, so I thought that was a pretty cool piece of information to learn. It was time to get back on track though, by giving the sapphire to Celio. With both of the gemstones in place, he was able to link the networking system with Lynette's system over in the Hoenn region. Now that the main story of the post game was over, there was only two more things left for me to do. One of those was to catch the legendary beast, Entei. Now what's cool about this roaming legendary Pokemon is that it will actually vary depending on which starter you chose. So if you began your journey with Squirtle, you'll encounter Raikou. By choosing Charmander, you would see Suicune. And by selecting Bulbasaur, you'll find Entei. And last but not least, now that the Sevi Island events were over, the entrance to the Cerulean Cave was opened up. This meant that we could capture Mewtwo, who ended up being a Surskid of all things, because once again, I randomized this playthrough. I know, what an anticlimactic ending. But with that, we have done just about all there is to do in the postgame of Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. The Sevi Islands as a whole seem to fly under the radar when it comes to these games, 
And I think that's pretty unfortunate, as it's really cool to discover some new areas and realize that that Team Rocket isn't done just yet. I had a lot of fun making this video, so definitely be sure to let me know what Pokemon game I should do next in the comment section below. For now though, have a great rest of your day, and until next time, deuces!